Good morning. How is everybody today? It's good to see you. It really is. You know, you, uh, you never know who's going to come at 7 o'clock in the morning. It, um, it was a bit of a tender ride over here for me today. Um, the last time I was at the early morning meetings of the Kansas-Nebraska conference, I was the chorister. I was uh, uh, young in the conference. I was, matter of fact, the newest pastor in the conference, I think, that I came. And, and um, you know what they do for the younger pastors? Um, they give them all those spots that nobody else wants, you know. And so they, they knew my dad was John Thurber, who used to sing, and, and they figured I sang. And so they assigned me to do the to do the, the song leading for the early morning service. And uh, so I used to lead the songs here. That's why the crowd is probably not bigger than it is. I, probably years ago, I you know, ruined that for people. Um, no, I love this morning crowd because you're the best singers. Even when I was sitting here, I stopped for a moment just to listen. And I could hear some tenors out there and some basses, and a beautiful alto. I don't know who was doing the alto nearby. And I love that you were singing in parts. That's the early morning crowd right there. But the other thing is, is that the speaker was my dad. So I was leading the song service for my dad, who was speaking. And this was back in the 80s. And uh, so it was a little tender for me, thinking about that. It's good to be here. Uh, Rick Mounts, um, you need to go to his seminars. He is a lover of people and uh, has got some beautiful things to say about how to really uh, bless you on your journey with your health. And Rick, I'm so glad to see you this morning. And I want to point out Brenda Dickerson over here to my left. Um, Court is sitting off all by herself over here. Brenda is, um, we have one of the finest um, editors and communication directors anywhere, and I'm so grateful for Brenda. And so, uh, glad to see you here this morning. Good to see you. Well, uh, the theme for camp meeting has right on the cover, Christ's Method Alone. So we, we all know that, right? Um, Christ's method alone will, will give true success in reaching people. Do you believe that? Amen. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them. He ministered to their needs and won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. I had a church member once uh, when I was living in Rocky Mountain. I had a church member once came and said, that's the most overused statement of Ellen White. I said, really? I said, now why would you say that? Well, he said, you know, people just want to quote that and it's in, and I, uh, and, and, uh, well, it's, they're trying to just get out of their evangelistic duty. And I said, well, I, I'm thinking it's really all about evangelism. Well, you know, the soft stuff. And then I coupled that. I was doing a series once when I was pastoring on the book of Ephesians. And, uh, you know, Ephesians talks a lot about how we treat one another. Get to chapter 4. It talks about no words spoken except those that are encouraging to those who hear, giving grace to those who hear, Right? Um, forgiving one another, even as Christ forgave you. And, and uh, one of my members said, you know, Pastor, when are you going to get out of the pablum? And you get into the real meat. And I said, well, I said, you know, if you go and you read Paul's epistles, I believe that's Jonathan, am I wrong? Isn't that kind of the meat? 
of what Paul is trying to talk to us about, how we treat one another is extremely important, how we care for one another. They'll know we are Christians by our by our understanding of the seven trumpets. They'll know we are Christians by the way we can articulate the 2300 days. Nothing wrong with those things. And I hope we can talk about those things. But we are known as followers of Christ by the way we care for each other. So I'm going to take this here and I'm going to break it down into three parts because I'm told that by 7.30 you're getting antsy about getting breakfast. So I've got to watch my time. So instead of covering the whole thing in one day, we're going to do it in three days. And we're just going to take the first part today. And uh, uh, I see three major themes in this statement. Three major themes in Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching people to Savior mingled with men as one who desire their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. And number three, he bade them follow me. Do you see three parts there? I kind of see three parts. And today I want to talk to you about uh, the first part. Uh, three components here. The first component, the Savior mingled with men as one who desire their good. The Savior entered the battle for people's salvation. That's the first thing. And by the way, he's our example, right? Okay, so, so uh, let's talk about entering the battle for people's salvation. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8. Becoming my favorite passage in Scripture. I got one that I like more. I'll tell you about maybe Sabbath morning. But this one, this one covers so much for me. It starts out by a call. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's a big call. <laughs> I'm reading out of the New American Standard Version here. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Is attitude important? Have you ever met somebody with B.A.? Bad attitude? You know, in Scripture, it's also with bad attitudes, things didn't go well. Remember Jonah? There's a good example of a fellow with a bad attitude. He preaches an evangelistic series, maybe one of the most successful recorded in history, right? A whole city of 120,000 plus are converted, and he's frustrated by it. Lord, I told you, you're so loving and kind, you'd forgive them, and now I'm in bear a bad attitude. Your attitude is huge. And the invitation is to have the same kind of attitude Jesus had. And look what his attitude was like. Have this attitude in yourself, which is in Christ Jesus. This is really profound. Just let it sink in this morning. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Here it is. But he emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Do you get the picture? This is the picture Paul is painting of what it meant for Christ to enter the battle for your and my salvation. This is a picture of Jesus entering the battle for you and me. He's in the throne room of heaven, the center of the universe. No better place can you be than the throne room. He looks down on humanity, which is struggling, which is just the opposite of who he is. As a matter of fact, 
while we were yet sinners, while we were obnoxious. That's when he came. And this was no cosmic accident. This was intentional. He intentionally left the center of the universe, made the journey down the stairway of stars to find himself in the arms of a teenage girl just outside of Bethlehem as a helpless baby, knowing full well that journey would go all the way to Calvary's cross. That's what Jesus did to enter the battle for you and me. Theologians call that the the, the kenosis, the the pouring out of God, you know, and into man. Biblical kenosis, that moment. That's what Jesus did. And it was costly. So you see this first little statement that says, Christ mingled among men? That's no small statement. Do you see what it took, what it cost for him to be able to mingle among men? He had to leave the throne room. And there's my whole point for my sermon this morning. We have to be willing to leave our throne room if we're going to follow Christ's method alone. And what's your throne room? I think it's different for all of us. What's keeping you? There are a lot of different kinds of throne rooms. For some men, it's sports. Yeah, I'd like to go help, but yeah, NBA Finals are this week. There you go. There's a bit of a throne room if you can let that overtake your life. Yeah, I'd like to enter and help people, but you, you know, I've got to study more on this area than I'm studying on. And yeah, you know, even, even the thirst for knowledge and, and whatever can keep you from mingling among men sometimes. Your throne room could be something that looks very good, but in essence may be keeping you from using Christ's method alone. I think it's different for all of us. Don't you think the devil knows that? Don't he knows he knows us. Does he knows our weaknesses? He knows our temptations. The call for us to enter the battle will always be costly. It'll never be convenient. And it'll be your cross. Look what it cost Christ. But if Christ's method alone is going to work, it'll never even get off the ground if we don't leave our throne room and make our journey where the people are to mingle and to be with them and to enter the battle for their very salvation. Who's done that for you? What I wish we had time is just to take a microphone and go around. Because there's not a person in this room that doesn't have a testimony of somebody who entered the battle for your life. They left their throne room and they spent time. They, they poured out themselves into your life. And if it wasn't for those people in your life, you wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be here today. I just, uh, my wife's 40th um, anniversary, alumni, 
for uh, high school just took place in April down at Mount Pisgah Academy. And that's an important school. That's where I met her. I graduated the year before her. Um, <clears throat> she went to mine last year, so I went to hers this year. And, and this year they did a, a celebration of, of uh, the boy's dean that was there when I was there. He was my dean. And they had a, a Saturday afternoon program, and I went to it, and the place was packed. And I just got emotional when I heard all the stories of why everyone came back to celebrate his ministry and what he did for my fellow classmates and why they are who they are today. And I had a testimony. My sophomore year in academy was my dumb year. Um, of course, it's the year you think you know everything. And it's been downhill ever since that year. Every year I know less and less. And I'm serious. Um, but boy, I thought I was on top of the world. I had, I had the world by the horns, you know. And, and I was given some responsibility. And uh, I don't have time to tell you the story, but um, I was a night watchman, and we got involved, several of us, there were about six of us that rotated, and we got involved with uh, skimming off the cafeteria at night. And we justified it. Well, you see, we were on the flat rate plan for food, and, and, and we never got breakfast because we were up late, you know. And it never dawned on us that maybe the food service manager might notice that some food was missing but we got very elaborate with what we were doing, and, and one of my friends got caught. And uh, matter of fact, he was the head RA. And the dean came to me the next day. I heard that he got caught, and I thought, all of us were now, we're all going to be going home, sent home. And, and he came to me the next day. He said, Gary, you know, my good friend, I love him, but he got caught. He can't be my head RA anymore. And he says, I want you to do it. I said, oh, Dane, he's a good guy. No, he won't let you down again. Yeah, you know, just say, yeah, no, he is a good guy, and every, but, but I, I got to have total trust, and, and Gary, I need you to step in now. Yeah, no, Dean, I, I, uh, yes, Gary, I'm going to need you to do this. And I said, I, I can't. Why? Because I've been taking food too, Dean. I'll never forget the look of hurt on his face. It wasn't anger. I could have handled anger. I disappointed him so deeply. He didn't say a word to me. He got out of the car and went to his apartment, and I thought I was going home. So I went to my room to pack, John. Literally. I went down to the janitor's closet. I got a couple boxes. I figured I was heading home, you know. And then once I confessed, the whole thing tumbled and everybody confessed and all of us knew we were done. We were all in trusted positions, you know. They called an emergency faculty meeting that night to figure out what to do with us. They talked about it. They were ready to take the vote to send us home. And the one that we disappointed, the one that we hurt the most, the one we let down, stood up. And he said, Give me another shot at these boys. Just, just let me have one more, one more shot. I'll take responsibility. I 
Klan by one vote on that faculty meeting that night, the dean got his wish. When someone loves you that much, you don't want to let them down. And not one of us six people let him down ever again. And every one of us are in the church today. He entered the battle for our very salvation. Cost him. Cost him a lot. But that's what he did. Can you imagine a church where Christ's method alone was truly being followed? Where everyone was willing to leave their throne room and sacrifice to enter the battle for the very salvation of those they sit next to in the pew in the church and those in their community. Can you imagine what a difference that would make? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, it blows our mind when we stop and we think about what Jesus has done for us. Titus tells us that when grace appeared, it brought salvation to all men, but that grace also was brought to us to teach us to live godly lives now in the present age. And as we, as we look upon your grace, the journey you took to enter the battle for our lives all the way to Calvary's cross, and we, we contemplate anew, as Ellen White tells us to every day, what that meant. We're overwhelmed again by the love that you have bestowed upon us. And it causes us to want to live godly lives now for you. It causes us to want to have the same attitude in ourself that was in you. It causes us to want to leave the throne room and be a blessing to those around us. Thank you. Thank you for entering the battle for our salvation. And now may we likewise do the same for those that you put in our path. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Have a wonderful day, Camille.